right. Well, for those of you who are new or haven't haven't been one of, on one of our events yet, um, my name is Caitlin Pena. I'm the Director of Operations and Programs for the Center for Election Science. I'll kind of be serving as your moderator today. So I'll be keeping um, tabs on what's going on in the chat and making notes of any questions so that once we get to the Q&A portion, um, I can kind of read those out for you guys. You can also, if you click on the participants button at the bottom of the screen, and then there's a, um, a button that says raise hand. So you can click on that and then um, we can selectively unmute you if you want to ask your question aloud. Um, and then I also just want to give a quick reminder that we've been having lots of events um, and they're all on different topics. And so we kind of want to try to keep keep our questions and our conversation um, to be on topic with what we're discussing today. So for example, if you have some questions about you know, technical aspects of voting methods, that might be better to email us at contact at electionscience.org or attend one of our other events, um, just so that we can keep the chat and the questions um, you know, contained and narrow because lots of people have have questions about, about what we're talking about. We wanna just stay on task. Um, so given that, I will hand it over to Chris and Kirsten. Chris is our Director of Campaigns and Advocacy and Kirsten is our Director of Philanthropy and they will be leading you through this awesome training. So, Chris. Thanks, Caitlin. Well, uh, as Caitlin said, my name is Kirsten Elliott. I'm our director of philanthropy, which uh, is just a fancy way of saying that I raise a lot of our money. And uh, Chris is our director of campaigns. And so both of us have quite a bit of experience creating compelling pitches for people about not only uh, elections, but, you know, just lots of different topics. We've worked in many different fields. So we really wanted to host this because we have found that when people are able to hone their pitch and they feel really comfortable with it, whether it's a staff person or a board member like Michael who's joining us or any of you, then we're able to more effectively share our message to the hundreds of thousands, millions of people that need to hear about how our elections are broken and how there's a really easy way to fix them. So thank you for joining us today for this workshop. We have a pretty small group. So, um, you know, if there's a question that comes up in the middle of this, we'll try to get to it um, as we can. Um, if it's pressing, if not, if you can try to hold them until the end, that'll make it easier for others who join this, uh, this recording later, because we will be posting this on YouTube. So Chris, if you can advance to the next slide. Okay, so what is an elevator pitch? Um, so it is going to be, as this says, a pitch. It's quick. It's an elevator ride. Um, and don't think about an elevator ride to like the top of the Empire State Building. Think about it in, you know, your local library, your apartment building, um, you know, two or three floors. So you, depending on how old your elevator is, you may have 10 seconds, you may have 30, you might get lucky and have a minute, but um, you're not going to have very much time. So we want this to be quick. The other nice thing is that much like a conversation you might have with a stranger in an elevator, these are not meant to be high stakes conversations. So you are not pitching this to the president of the United States. That's not what we're teaching you to do today. We're talking about your friend, your family member, someone that you run into at a bar when we're finally all able to go back about our lives, things like that. It's also not a presentation. This is not a TED talk. You do not need to rehearse this. In fact, if you rehearse this too much, you will sound like a robot and you will not encourage anyone to get involved in what you're inviting them to be involved in. And then finally, I would say that um, when we're looking at elevator pitches, it hopefully invites more conversation. So we don't just want this to be us talking at someone from our point of view and what we think will resonate, you know, with someone who's very like minded with us. We want to be thinking about the person we're talking to and what might resonate with them. So that is what an elevator pitch is and is not. Next slide. So why should you care? Well, you're here, so you do. Um, for, for some reason, you thought that this was important for you to attend. But, um, you know, if maybe somebody pushed you into coming today and you aren't really sure if you're going to stick around for the whole recording, here's my sales pitch. My quick elevator pitch on elevator pitches if we want to get meta. So there's a lot of applications for elevator pitches. When you think about your work, if you are selling the services that you offer at your business, 
Uh, maybe you serve on the board of directors for a nonprofit or you volunteer for a nonprofit. That can be a really easy, free way to help that nonprofit get their, the word out. But also it's important for personal relationships. So if you think about networking to establish your own personal brand, um, so Michael, I'm going to keep picking on a little bit. He's one of our board members. He's an actor. You know, if Michael is a good networker, if he's able to establish his personal brand really well, maybe he lands a new acting gig and that would be really fantastic. Um, but I mean, even if it's just meeting someone who might be a potential friend, right? The more that you can sell who you are and why you're an interesting person and they should want to hang out with you, that's a good thing, right? We all like to have nice networks that we can rely on for uh, business ideas or just for going out and having drinks with, right? Um, it's also a pretty simple idea, so this shouldn't be anything that's too complicated. Again, we're not trying to rehearse a TED talk here. We're just trying to work on our communication skills. And then I would say there's also a really large return on investment that could potentially come from this. It only takes one of these 10, 20, 30 second conversations to go right for you to land a seven figure contract for your employer or for you to find your husband. I don't know. Like there are all sorts of things that could happen if you have a carefully refined pitch. Um, and I have certainly seen that over the history of my career and I'm sure Chris has as well. Okay, next slide. Did you get the next slide? <laughs> there we go. Okay. What makes a good elevator pitch? So as I said, we're going to try to keep it brief. Uh, no more than 30 seconds if we can. It will quickly get the person's attention so that they're actually listening to you and not just hoping that the elevator door is going to open soon. I would say that you wanna provide enough detail that it's interesting, but not too much. We're not looking to get really technical here. And we also wanna have a, a CTA, a call to action. So this is something that I think is really critical. I find in my work in fundraising, but I am sure that Chris finds in his work with organizing as well. If you just talk at someone and about yourself and you don't provide some reason for them to get involved or some way for them to follow up, that's probably the end of the conversation and that makes it less of a good use of your time. So these are the things that we're going to be looking for when we're talking about elevator pitches. Next slide. So um, I'm going to transition here just a little bit um, to Chris because Chris has a really great activity that we're going to work through today. I often teach elevator pitches in um, small group settings with like board members and things like that. But Chris has a great formula that I love that I think works in big group settings. So um, I'm going to pitch it to him here in just a second. But these are some other things that you're going to be wanting to keep in mind as we are looking at elevator pitches. We want to keep it interesting, brief, simple, concise, and we want to win people over. So Chris, how do we actually do that? That is a great question. Did I draw on the screen? And then we do. Where does this all come from, right? So let's say you are, you actually get a chance to uh, talk about approved voting, right? Let's say, you know, sometimes it'll be, you know, a friend, sometimes it'll be, uh, hold on one second. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, no? Okay, great. Thank you guys, sorry. No one said anything for a minute. Um, so just my background. My background is I worked on uh, political campaigns, especially with candidates for, you know, seven, eight years. And uh, when you are a candidate, you get invited to dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, debates. And, you, and I'm sure we've all seen debates on TV. Uh, they have to get these these really important ideas. You know, what are you gonna do about climate change? What's your plan for this? What's your plan for that um, in one minute? And uh, as you can tell, it is, uh, it's hard to do that, right? How do you, how do you boil down everything in one minute? Uh, and let's say you're out there in the world uh, and you finally get an opportunity to talk about approved voting, you are competing with this. You can't see it. It is a, little distraction machine that is your phone, right? That's why I put this guy in here. So the number one thing I want you to keep in mind is you have less time than ever to keep people's attention. So your goal is to, whatever you do, however you say it, is to keep it interesting and to keep it short, right? I always try to think in my mind, okay, if I was a candidate and I had one minute 
in a debate to talk about approved voting, how would I do it? And uh, we're gonna go through a little exercise today to uh, help you guys think through that process. Now, the number one thing you are probably asking is, well, okay, well, how do I do this? Uh, you know, how, let's say I'm in front of everyone, like, understand, it's supposed to be short, yeah, yeah, yeah. what do I say, right? Uh, you already know how to do this process, right? You've been in high school, it was beaten to you in high school and, and elementary school, middle school, in college, right? There's a reason it's not the eight paragraph essay, it's the reason it's not a 10 paragraph essay. Five paragraph essay is short enough for you to get your point across um, and, 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 and forces you to, to boil things down into its most, uh, you know, purest essence, right? So you have, uh, what well, you have in a, in a five paragraph essay, you have a hook, you have something interesting in the beginning, uh, your thesis, what is this supposed to be about? Uh, you know, your three paragraphs by your argument and then your conclusion. The thing about a, a, a pitch is essentially it's a five paragraph essay, right? You're doing the same thing. Uh, just, you know, how you do it changes a little bit. Uh, so I, I normally boil it down to four, uh, four parts of a good pitch, right? You have an anecdote and that's a story of someone you've heard or your personal story that you use that's interesting. You have your thesis, which is, you know, again, what the heart of what you're trying to say. You know, your supporting points, which is maybe where you throw, you know, your arguments and the perfect, I call it the perfect world ending. And we are going to do that together today. But in the meantime, I will have uh, Kirsten give an example of how this looks. Thanks, Chris. So yeah, so um, when we were in St. Louis last year for our staff board retreat that we do annually, Chris kind of sprung this on the rest of the team and he said, okay, this is how it works. Now you're going to write it. And um, as much as I have done this before, it was really terrifying. So I'm going to give you what I worked on then because I think it's a really good example of having to do one on the fly. Um, and that's where you would likely find yourself here. So a little bit of backstory. The question here was what is vote splitting? And um, since we were in St. Louis, I tried to frame it that way. So backdoor discussions to privatize the airport and an unresolved increase in the number of violent crimes have ravaged St. Louis. And it's all thanks to our broken democracy, a democracy that by design has allowed candidates to win, an ele win elections with only a third of the city behind them, despite all of the challenges ahead of them. The fact is, these ill-advised policies are a direct result of the way we choose our elected officials in St. Louis, because we only allow voters to select one candidate and a crowded field of candidates with similar ideologies, we encourage vote splitting. That means the way that we vote literally means that when we offer voters more choices, they're more likely to get a worse outcome. But it doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to keep dividing our city. We can reunite St. Louis with a better way of voting, and we can elect a leader who represents all of us, not just a fraction of us. St. Louis has an opportunity to pull together and stop dividing ourselves. We just have to rise to the challenge ahead of us. This was by no means perfect, but it was great. this is the idea that we're trying to go with here. That's great. And uh, hopefully you all saw some of the things uh, that we're talking about here, but don't worry, we are going to go into them in detail. But thank you, Kirsten, for sharing that. We'll use that as the basis uh, to talk going forward. Uh, so, in the meantime, uh, we're going to go through this step by step, but every one of you has a prompt. This is an interactive, uh, this is an interactive piece today, okay? I would like for everyone to write on their own, you can do it on the computer, they can scribble down notes. Um, by the end, I would like people to share, we'll, we'll give people a little bit of time at the end. Uh, the prompt is, why do we need approval voting in our local elections? That is your prompt. Think about that. Keep that in the back of your mind as we move forward. Everyone got that? Why do we need approval voting in our local elections? So the thesis. The thesis is, so Chris, didn't you put the anecdote before the thesis in your, in your uh, thing before? Yes, I did. Right? But just like in an article you would write for school or an academic article, you don't start with the thesis, right? We need better elections because that's boring. However, 
this is your guiding, guiding light of, of the whole piece. This is the theme. This is the heart of what you want to say, right? So, for example, uh, Kirsten's piece was, we have these problems because of broken elections. That was the thesis, right? Uh, and that is the point of the thesis is, it's supposed to be the number one thing you want people to take away, right? And there's two ways, you know, there's, there's a couple different ways that, uh, to do this argument, right? To figure out what's the most important part of the thesis. One is to do what I just said. What is the one thing I want them to walk away with, right? The other thing is do it, especially something like proof voting is, okay, boil it down to 10 words or less. Proof of voting causes bad outcomes, right? Proof of voting is hurting our city, right? That's, that's at the core of what Kirsten said. Um, I challenge you to even make it seven words or less, less right? Sometimes 10 is too easy. Um, this is what your the, your, you really want to drive home. And sometimes, and make sure one, one point here is, remember you're saying this, right? You're saying this out loud. You don't get to write it down. People don't get to get visual aids. This is, make sure you're focusing only on one piece, right? Don't, you know, don't focus on how it's this or that, you know, don't focus about all 10 different aspects of the city, right? Kurt, like Kirsten, that you broke down, you have a lot of issues, but they have one source, right? And that's broken elections. Uh, let's keep moving. And uh, Kirsten, Caitlin, let me know if there's any other questions that kind of come up. Um, so with the thesis in hand, right? So everyone's starting to think about their thesis a little bit for their prompts, right? Okay, good. Anecdotes. So what is the anecdote? The anecdote is, uh, or, or to use a, a phrase from a, a recent uh, uh, interview we just did with uh, Wally, Dr. Wally Seward in St. Louis, he says there's two ways you get people's attention, pain and stories, right? That's the only way to get people interested in what you're talking about. Your job is you are competing with people's phone. You're competing with people's thoughts. You're competing with how people deal with their everyday life. You have to do something that makes it interesting, right? This is the headline. This is what brings people into the story. And nothing is better than your personal story, period. A lot of time people don't think, uh, what I have to say is interesting, completely opposite. I speak, I, every group, especially all approved voting groups that I talk to, they ask, what do I say? I say, talk about why you're here. Talk about how these problems aren't getting done in your community. Talk about how, you know, your friends and family are impacted by this. Talk about how, you know, for me it was, I would work in campaigns and no matter what I did, I saw the process was broken, right? That's part of my story, that's why I'm here. Um, this is where you get to be the most creative and you get to create a, create a theme, right? So I showed the picture of this, well, this woman holding a, a picture, right? She's, you can tell, she's gonna tell a story about her family, right? And I had one candidate who uh, would talk about his father fighting in D-Day as a way to show people the freedoms fought for in this country and why we should do better, right? It was an interesting way to make people wake up. And the one of the last things I'll say about this is people are expecting you to say something boring or logical, right? That's what people say. People, and be, okay, it's another announcement. It's another announcement. This is about your heart, right? This is where you get to show people who you are. Tell a joke, right? Uh, say something that's a little scary, right? Let, bring up a hero, bring up a villain, right? Uh, another great one is, what if I told you? <laughs> you know, like, what if, get people to imagine. Um, and you're looking to re just really get it in, in the framework of, of people, right? And that's difficult to prove voting. We haven't had a lot of, you know, it's, it's math, math, right? Mathematically, a lot of people like it. Um, we got to get past that. And, and if you ever see the stuff in Fargo, uh, the great work they do in Fargo and the great work they do in St. Louis, they make it about the people and making sure that their voice is heard. So you, that anecdote, 
ties into your thesis. So you've been thinking about your thesis for a little bit. Think about your anecdote. So you have a great thesis, you have a great anecdote, you have this great anecdote that, that wakes people up and say, what did they just say? They have a thesis, you, you gave them like, I'm gonna hit you with this. Now you gotta back it up, right? This is the why, this is the how, this is how we're gonna win, right? So there's a, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. Or maybe you could do it step by step. First, we get people interested in approved voting. Second, we get people to use approved voting. Third, we're gonna, you know, you, you get people from where you've started to where you're gonna go. We're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, these points are often confused as the thesis, right? I like approved voting because it can be done inexpensively. That may be a thesis, right? But that's often a point, right? Why is approval voting? Approval voting is great. It's maybe your thesis and works for our town. But it's, it's you know, make sure you're not confusing the, the you know, your points with the, the heart of what you're trying to do. The thesis is more of the essence, right? These are more logic based. You know, did you know we had eight elections where the winner didn't have 30% of the vote, right? Uh, that's important. And notice that I did not start all of this saying, you know, using a number like that, right? Numbers at the beginning as your anecdote, you gotta be really careful. And most people, numbers don't mean a lot to them, right? People like numbers, um, but this is the time to bring up numbers, right? Say you say it's morally wrong to have elections be like this, this and this, and then you can get into the logic like this. That's what your points are for, right? And uh, again, it, it, all their job is to do is support the thesis, and I have these bobbleheads because uh, that's what you want to see, right? That's what we're here for. Is you're just like you want to see the heads nod, right? You want to see like uh, it, that's something you get with when you when you say something out loud that you don't get to see when you are uh, you know maybe writing it down. Right, that's why it's so important to try to say this out loud and test it. And if you know you see people's heads nod, you're on the right track. <laughs> you know that's normally pretty good. You're going for you're, and you're going for to make it the broadest audience possible, right? And and thankfully, Americans are very expressive. They often go like, oh, yeah, "That's good." That's what you're looking for, right? And finally, oh, but before we get to the ending, the ending is what I call the perfect world ending. Before we get to there, there's one very important thing we need to talk about for endings. Everyone loves to talk about the beginnings and the endings. There are two types of endings, right? There are cliffs and, that there, and then there are ramps, right? So we've all seen a cliff. You know, someone says, approval voting is the best thing that we can do. That's boring, that's awful, right? Or, you know, Compare, especially when compared to uh, other methods, approved voting is the obvious choice, right? Something maybe based in logic or, um, or with approval voting, we can have a world without bad elections. That's a big one, right? So that's what I call it the, the negative framing. Most people, a lot of smart people, right? People that are trying to work on big problems, uh, it's often the we would like the the absence of something, right? We'd like we would like the absence of bad elections. We would like the absence of climate change, right? We would like we'd like those things to not happen. People imagine in their world concrete things. We are we are trying to get them to imagine something positive, right? Um, and often Cliff too is especially if you have that maybe one minute clock in your head. Right, I want you to keep that. That's very important. You you want to hit, you want to beat that clock. You want to be done before one minute, right? After one minute, you you kind of start to lose, right? We don't want to do that. A ramp is something that ends up on a high note, right? Uh, you know, something that finishes, someone that finishes with energy and does that call to action, right? It ties back to that human thing, the the emotional part or the the themes you've set up originally, and it's framed positively. So it isn't, the biggest way I mean to get that across is, it's not a world without, it's a world with, right? Does that make any sense? It's not a world without bad elections, 
It's a world with good elections. It's a world where elections represent the will of the people, something positive, right? Not the negative. Um, and again, you, you tighten it up, you, you bring it on home. So it's, it, you want, you're ending your perfect world. You want to end visualizing a perfect world. You want to hit that ramp, right? You want to go Dukes of Hazzard, jump straight off. Uh, and and, and it, it's hard, right? You, you want to think about what you want, right? It's, it, 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 you have to show people a world where you want, let's say climate change is something big to you. I want a world where uh, the air and water are clean and that, you know we get to live here for 200 years. Right, where where we could, uh, you know, where my family and friends in Florida have a nice place to live for a long time, right? That's positive. That's inclusive. And again, you're going to keep your eye on the clock. One thing I want to, uh, one theory I want to get out across to you guys real quick is I don't know if you've ever heard the best way to draw a straight line, right? You know, some people they draw a draw straight line, but some people do. You make your starting point and you pick your end point, right? And if you draw a little dot for your endpoint, and you just focus on that dot, you'll hit that line, right? And you'll have a nice straight line almost every time, uh, instead of focusing it down the line and hopefully getting a straight line. This is your dot. You're setting up your dot ahead of time, right? You know I want to end with a perfect world. And because you have this, let's say, you realize, oh crap, <laughs> I'm going way over time. It's going way too, like, I'm going way too slow. I need to wrap this up, right? Maybe wrap up everything else, maybe some of your points, and just hit your perfect world. And again, you want it to be that perfect world people want to live, and it has that call to action piece. Okay. Now, we threw a lot at you guys. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put, I can put these back up as you need. Um, maybe take, maybe we'll take some questions, but as we do that, I would encourage people to fill out their prompt. You can see us mirroring the importance of keeping things short because this is by far the shortest presentation we have done on Zoom because we really do want to hear from you all. So what questions do you all have? Is anybody confused? Are there parts that you want Chris to explain more? Feel free to stick your questions in the chat or um, digitally raise your hand and we can unmute you if you have any questions or comments even if you just have an idea for what you might um, say in response to why is approval voting good we're happy to hear your thoughts as well so michael raised his hand and i have unmuted him i just wanted to clarify um chris uh, misspoke at one point and said approval voting when he meant plurality voting approval voting is good Plurality voting is bad. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Sorry. I can't believe that even left my lips like that. Um, Colin did ask, does each of you have one or two examples to share or just Kirsten? Um, I did not. I unfortunately didn't come prepared with an example. Um, I'm not sure if, if Chris has one or if he if he wants to try off the cuff. Um, give me I can either find my old one. Or you know, I'm, I can give I can give an example. Uh, one is basically you don't always have right. You never know. Sometimes you don't always know you know when you're going to have to be able to give a pitch, right? So uh, I'll do I'll do mine then. I'll do mine then. Um, you know, I have worked. I have knocked on thousands of doors. I've gotten chased by dogs. I've had guns pointed in my face. I have uh, gone up and down long driveways just to find that no one was home. I've worked on over 10 elections in my life. And, you know, from dog catcher to Congress. And one day I was in my office in, in Roanoke, Virginia, working on a congressional campaign, and I realized it didn't matter if we won. 
system was broken, right? I knew the system was not going to get the things done that I needed to, because even if I got this person in there that I believed in, they were not going to be able to make the impact, even the impact that we wanted to make, right? Because the system was so broken. And that's why I'm here, because approval voting gives people the opportunity to unbreak that system. And what does that mean? Why is that system so broken? One is when you work on a campaign, the point is to try to find the number of people, the least number of people to talk to, right? You think it's a campaign, it's about getting all the votes possible. We have all the data we need. We have everything else we need. We know who will vote and who will not vote. Right? They know, I thought that's not me anymore. The goal is to get it to that lowest number possible because you have finite time, you have finite money. Approval voting forces politicians and forces campaigns to go and talk to more people. And why is that better? Because candidates can win with 32% of the vote, time and time and time again, and never, and their point is to make sure that they don't lose that 32%. It's not to do anything that might <laughs> help the 72%. It's about getting that 32% to stay. So with approval voting, we have approval voting in Fargo, North Dakota. We're well on our way to get it in St. Louis, Missouri. I can't imagine a place that needs it more, but every community in America can use it and every community in America needs it. And that's why I need your help I need your help to make sure that we get the word out about approval voting. Please consider giving money. Please consider giving your time. So we can have a world where every campaign, and every politician is forced to listen to people like you. How about that? I am going to pick at you for the fact that that was far over one minute, Chris. So There's we're going to have to snap right this one together. I brought it home. Hey, is that a cup, okay? But so that's a good point. We don't want this, what we were talking about earlier, we don't want this to seem like it's a presentation, but it does help, like Chris said, to practice it. Um, Sophia had a question in the chat. So Sophia, we can unmute you now. Oh, there we go. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if, Chris's example almost like a little bit answered my question, but I'll kind of ask it anyway, which is like, I guess one of the things I'm thinking of is that sort of like common wisdom around selling something is like emphasize the positives instead of the negatives. And I'm wondering if you feel like that applies here, because if you pair that with the advice to like use anecdotes, I feel like the anecdotes that are most grabbing tend to be the sort of like negative things like bad experiences or like bad outcomes of like the system we have now or something like that. Um, and I guess I was just wondering, I'm trying to, to grapple with like, how do I combine using an anecdote that's effective that might be sort of like negative in tone with the idea of trying to sell something by like emphasizing the positives and the benefits of it. And I mean, Chris had great anecdotes, but I'm wondering which were like fun. Like I don't, I mean, yes, the like dog barking and gun in your face is like, they're negative, but it's like, it's, it's, really doesn't have that feeling to it because they're so like evocative and can be like used in a sort of like funny personal story way. So I think he did a really good job with that, but I'm wondering if like him being able to do that is kind of unique to his experience here where like for the most part, the rest of us can't say like, I worked on elections, you know, like I worked on campaigns. And so I think that when you have that, it's easier to sort of like, you're already in the context of the topic. So you like have things to grab from that are relevant and so I'm kind of just wondering like how do you think the rest of us should balance that tension sorry that was yeah. the wrong question no that's a fantastic question and I get that kind of you know I understand that right you know I was on the campaign side right um I hope what one thing that came across was like you know I knew that most of you have not probably worked on campaigns probably and especially to the extent that I have so part of my my goal was to maybe shock people a little bit in the and the speaking to as few people as possible, right? I am totally on board. Your, your goal is to wake people up, right? People are, the status quo is, you know, I'm just gonna talk and I'll get through it for a minute, right? If, if let's say, you know, one piece of it is, and I, and I only use this as an example because we've 
uh, I know people talk about this in, in St. Louis is you could start it being like, we live, you know, if you lived in St. Louis, you're talking maybe St. Louis crowd, St. Louis has the highest murder rate in the United States, right? Uh, dozens of people die needlessly every day in St. Louis. Why aren't we taking care of that? Why, how is that acceptable by any means? And we have, you know, I got to toe the line a little bit, but you know, if I was in St. Louis, maybe I would say, who's listening to us, right? Who, why we elect these people? And I, you may not understand, but the way we elect them means whether they listen to us or not, right? So, and this is a debate we often, I, I really try to, not debate, but it's a, it's a question that comes up a ton, is how do you connect basically the policy thing, right? That was the policy thing we want. Most of the time we, we want an end to bad stuff, right? But like we, like we said, um, talk about, it, it's okay to talk about your friend. It's okay to talk about, you know, uh, it's okay to talk about your family. It's okay to talk about, uh, you know, another thing I often bring up and it, it was kind of an easy crutch is a villain. Right, I used to bring it all the time, you know. And partisan campaigns, there's quite clear villains and heroes, right? You know, when I was on the front lines with Senator so and so, that's cool. Or I knocked doors with, uh, you know, this person, and they said never give up. And that made me, you know, there's a hundred different ways, but really, I want you to think about, and largely, it comes down to this question: Why are you here, you personally, Sophia? Right? Why are you here? That's the most important question. That's organizing day number one, question number one, right? Why are you here? That's your story, right? Yeah. I wanna piggyback in here too, because I deal with this a lot, Sophia, um, in terms of what I do. So I write a lot of grants, I talk to a lot of our donors, and I think you're right. We wanna focus on the positives, like when we're trying to sell someone on something, and largely this is, but I, I don't think you can effectively sell something to someone if you don't create a problem. That's also kind of selling and marketing 101 is there has to be a problem and either it has to exist naturally or we have to create it. And in our case here, we don't have to create it. The problem already exists. Um, I think the point is just not to belabor it too much. So if I'm writing a grant proposal, I let the funder know that there are lots of problems in our democracy, but there's a really easy and simple way to fix it. And I try to get into that as quickly as I can. Um, and I had another thought as well, like in trying to frame this, um, I think another way is maybe just to think of the negative and flip it on its head. So I think in St. Louis, it's really easy to think of how there's all this vote splitting and it's really awful and it kind of is part of the um, systemic racism that exists in St. Louis. But I think the other thing that you could use in that example is how many candidates of color ran last time and how incredible it is that there are all these people that more accurately represent the city of St. Louis that are stepping up to lead as mayor, but then we're not ending up with that person that's in that seat of power. And, but it's a problem that's very easily solvable. So I hope that that gives like another idea on how you might be able to frame things a little more positively. Any other questions? Feel free to stick them in the chat or um, raise your hand. Um, Mindy says approval voting. I'm confused. It boils down to money. Um, Mindy, can you further clarify or if, if you want, I can um, unmute you. Looks like Brian has his hand raised now too. Oh, okay. Well, let's give Mindy a minute if she wants to clarify in the chat and then I will go ahead and lower Brian or uh, unmute Brian. Hello. Oh, is that Mindy? That's me. Okay, go ahead and then we'll go to Brian. Um, the question that I have is and the reason I said confused is uh, it seems to always boil down to money in campaigns. If you don't have the money, even even local elections on the township level, um, you know, on the borough level, you have to have money to put into these campaigns to even get anywhere. You don't have the money, you don't have the backing. You know, I'm confused because it sounds like, well, you can just have a bunch of people out there 
uh, running for office, um, but you have to have money to be heard and your and for your ideas to be heard. And that's one thing here that I haven't heard mentioned at all. So I'm, I'm that's why I'm confused because uh, the the money is the root of where you're going to go and how far you're going to go. Uh, hey, that's a great question, Mindy. I think, uh, and it brings up a very important piece, is sometimes you have to think, and especially with a thing like approval voting, you have to think about the process backwards, right? So for example, uh, Mindy, in your, in your case, it's money, right? Money is not going anywhere, at, period, and then, <laughs> and, it's, it looks like it's gonna be with us for elections for a while. Uh, part, so let's you know deconstruct that problem, right? So part of who gets money is people who are viable, right? So first off, you get no money if you don't run. If you don't run, it's probably because uh, either maybe you didn't think you'd get the money or you didn't think you could get the votes or you know, there's four or five people running already that already have your platform. You're gonna split with them. Right, the money uh, part of that process, and one of the you know one of the ways you might attack that is, listen, I know that mayor such and such has deep pockets or gets money from this and and that, but I think that with approval voting, the ideas will stand out more. Right, money will still be there. We're not going to get rid of money, but. If you have a good idea, that matters more because you can actually get the votes, right? It's not just about uh, it's not just about how many ads can I do, right? You're going to have to stand up against everyone else, and you're going to have to have good ideas, right? And you can put your name on every billboard, but if your ideas stink, people will know that, and people will have the opportunity to vote on it. We don't have the answer yet, right? We don't have that answer. That you know, how will this come back? Uh, the money in politics part, but we are at uh, that piece we're working out, but we are at least going to empower the voter. And by empowering the voter, candidates have more people that they can go for because at the end, the only thing that matters is the votes. So in, that's a great question, Mindy. You just gotta kind of deconstruct a little bit. And now, you know, I wasn't trying to fit approved voting in a, in a box. But I believe that. I believe that, you know, you have more candidates, they'll have better ideas. And, you know, we see that in the Democratic uh, presidential primary we just had. There were people who had great ideas, right? Really good ideas. They're really floated to the top. And, it, what, and we see it in our research. They could not just get past the plurality voting, right? And we all know, too, people get money to winners, <laughs> right? They give money to people they think are going to win, right? I think... If this changes who may win, it can change who gets money. All right, well, I think uh, Brian still has his hand up, so I'll go ahead and unmute him. All right, okay, so, Brian. <clears throat> thanks. I thought maybe you guys are gonna have a, a pitch already pretty much distilled and ready to hand out for us to memorize. Uh, this is kind of, kind of what I was thinking, but I'm a little bit confused because it, it seems to me that the city or the campaign that we're trying to get approval voting implemented in is going to dictate what the pitch is going to be. And I didn't know how much of it was campaign or city specific and how much of it was personal, because I guess if I'm at a Thanksgiving table talking to relatives about approval voting, I have a very personal pitch and for uh, the, the what you did in St. Louis, I would think everybody's going door to door pretty much would use a generic pitch, but I, what do you say about that? I, oh, sorry, Chris, I didn't mean to jump in. Um, I was gonna say go, Chris. So, um, so Brian, I think that you bring up a really good point here and that's the point of framing. Um, we could certainly, I mean, we have tried to develop some resources on the CES website. One of those was a letter to the editor template. Um, but in that workshop that we did recently, we had uh, a newspaper veteran from uh, Arkansas come and talk about his experience with that. And he said, look, he's like, we can tell when there's a letter writing campaign, we don't publish them. 
I think the same thing can be said with elevator pitches. People can tell when you came and you just rehearsed some lines. It's going to sound disingenuous. People aren't going to pick it up. It's a little bit more work, but um, I, take a second. I know Brian, I've met him. We both live in Arkansas. Um, Brian, you have a really great story, I think. And I think it just depends on who you're talking to. Um, you know, certainly we can talk about if there's not an active campaign happening, we can talk about maybe the Democratic primary that Chris just mentioned. And that's very salient for a lot of people. But if you know the person that you're talking to, it's someone at the dinner table, maybe it's the mayoral race in Little Rock, or maybe it's the governor's race that you talk about. Um, so there is, a, there is an aspect of knowing your audience. Um, I, I would say in my opinion, when I have had to do pitching, if I don't know someone's um, background or I'm not from the area, I try to stick with national politics um, and then just be very, very careful that you don't seem like you're picking any one candidate as your favorite because you uh, also might alienate someone who doesn't believe the same way that you do. Yeah, also by Kirsten. Again, uh, Brian, just real quick, your story is the only story that people care about. Right. I mean, to be blunt, you know, they don't want to hear you telling somebody else's story. They want to hear you, why you think it's good. And that's what we push. Really, we try really hard at CES to people tell us all the time exactly what you said, Brian. Just tell me what to say. I'll say it. Right. And, and you're not wrong, you know, to, to believe that. Um, but we know what is powerful and to grow this movement in general is people like yourself, you know, thinking through, you know, on, on, this is why we do this exercise when you're not put on the spot, <laughs> right? You do this exercise at a time. So if you ever need to, you say, you know, oh, I'm going to bring up how I worked in that campaign. Or I'm going to bring up this and that. Um, we've got another question in here from Mindy. She says, is the goal here to run for a position yourself or is the goal to sign up a lot of people to run in an election? Approval voting is not well defined in this exercise. So, so first off, Mindy, we, we advocate for approval voting and then I'm sure there will be two or three people who put links in the chat after I say that. So it's a type of voting where you vote for all the people that you like. Uh, I will let the, the, the articles you will get in the meantime uh, help explain that. Uh, what we are pushing, any, if anything we're pushing for is assuming you're talking to a bunch of people who have no clue what that means and how it may help them, right? What it means to you, how it may help them. That's what we're talking about. And we're using this specifically uh, to, uh, you know, to get people thinking about, okay, how would I pitch a friend? How would I pitch the League of Women Voters on, on supporting this? That's, that's normally kind of what we're looking for. I see that Colin has helped us out here with a list of common complaints about the status quo um, that he thinks approval voting would improve. So he says, extreme, partisan, popularity contest, personality contest, horse race, voter suppression, low turnout, the electoral college, my candidate lost, money in politics, no good candidates. Um, I think if anyone is scratching their head right now, those are all really good answers. But I do think it would be interesting. We only have a few of you here. So I mean, you're welcome to put it in the chat or if you just want to unmute yourself. I'd be really interested. I think something that we don't talk about a lot at CES because it can get more partisan and we are totally nonpartisan is um, specific uh, topics that you think would be improved by uh, approval voting. So again, I'm going to pick on Michael for a second. I know that Michael cares a lot about environmental causes and that's a lot of the reason that he cares um, about approval voting. So um, if anybody wants to share in the chat what their you know, particular policy issues that are that they care about, that might inspire some people too. I, I don't think Michael is on the chat anymore. Oh, there he is. Yeah, okay, Michael. sorry. I thought- So he had just left. Oh, okay, yeah, the, the videos went out of order at the top of my screen. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself, Michael. Uh, yeah, was, sorry, was that a, that was a question to me? 
No, I don't, I don't think so. I think she was just making sure that you were still on there. And I was just saying that environmental issues were an issue that you care about. But Michael, is there anything else that you can think of policy-wise that you care about that is why uh, you are interested in approval voting? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the fundamental problem uh, for, for me, approval of voting solves this fundamental problem of having elected representatives who don't, who aren't responsive to what voters want. And I think there are tons and tons of things that voters want that are, that are very, you know, wildly popular things that, that the government ought to be doing and isn't doing simply because they're not, they're more responsive to moneyed interests than they are to the, the will of the voters. And that's because the voters can't really say what they want with our voting system. So it, saving the planet, top of the list. Um, you know, if you believe that we should have universal health care, or if you believe in, um, um, you know, supports like that, or um, I wrote down a list of things once. Let me see if I have it at hand. Well, Michael is pulling up his list, and because we are going to post this on YouTube later and share it on social media, I did just want to remind everyone that. Um, I know that we may not want to share our elevator pitches here live, but if you are interested in having your pitch reviewed, even if it's just written out, or if you want to film yourself, you can send it to us at contact at electionscience.org. We're going to put a June 1st deadline on that, but as long as you send it to us by then, we're happy to review it, provide some helpful feedback so that you can hone your pitch. I found a list of policies that I think are um, sort of things that people might care about that are problems that aren't getting fixed because of unresponsive politicians. And this was just my own list. Shall I read it off? Please. Climate change, lack of health care, poor education, lack of elder care, lack of child care, lack of parental leave, too much corporate influence over politicians, um, corporate welfare, Amazon doesn't pay taxes. Verizon gets to deduct what it pays its employees, but as an actor, I don't get to deduct what I pay my agents. Uh, system rigged for large corporations against everyone else, low voter turnout, dissatisfaction with elected representatives, lack of new ideas or parties in elections, gerrymandering, increasingly complex and unclear laws that require the hiring of revolving door consultants. There we go. I think those are all great. Does anybody else want to share anything else or have any questions? It looks like uh, Brian may have raised his hand again. Oh, go ahead. Yes, yeah, I had this interesting idea a while back that I'd missed mentioned to Kirsten before that you had mentioned ending on a perfect world high note. <clears throat> And I really love that short little uh, video that I've seen on the trophic cascade that happened in Yellowstone National Park when all they did was introduce wolves and they stepped back and they had this massive, this amazing uh, ripple effect. And that's sort of, sort of my view of what approval voting would do to our elections and our probably our whole political landscape. And I wonder what you guys thought of that idea. I love that. Um, I think we need to grab that link and put that in the YouTube description, but also maybe in the chat for people who aren't familiar with it, because Colin said Brian may be stealing his question. And so I, I think we uh, may, have, may have been on the same wavelength. But um, yeah, I, I think that that's a great example, Brian. I mean, what a great way to explain to someone the importance of protecting our environment, but in a really positive way that just leaves you feeling like there are possibilities to do good. I also think about like what's happening right now um, when we're talking about this pandemic and there are so many bad things that are happening, but then we look and we see these stories of people in India being able to see mountain ranges that they haven't been able to see in their lifetime because there's been so much pollution, right? That's pretty cool. So I will, I, I will jump on Colin's question. He, he asked to explain the perfect world a little bit more and then, uh, you know, uh, and does approval voting uh, create a perfect world? Well, yeah, if you, you know, if you want to be, uh, you know, just rhetorical, but um, the perfect world, Colin, is we simply what they said, right? 
imagining what the outcome is, not what the outcome is not, right? And by, what I mean by that is we often talk about uh, a world without, a perfect example, you know, parks without trash, you know, uh, you know, no litter, you know, clean, eh, but right, you're thinking about the trash, right? You're not thinking about the park. Is that enough? Is that a good example? Like, I want you to think about a, a, you know, a clean and pristine park with, you know, ducks back on the pond and kids playing on the playground and grand. I'm not talking about the trash. You know, the whole thing could have been about we need a recycling campaign, right? But I want you to focus on what it is, not what it is not. And, you know, you probably, when I said trash, you imagined trash, right? You didn't imagine park, right? I want you to imagine park. And we think approval voting, maybe to put this in a nice bow, is, you know, we think democracy is the park, right? We think democracy is beautiful and good. There's a lot of trash on it, right? And I don't want, us to, and we focus endlessly on the trash, right? But we think with approval voting, it's a way for us to clean the park, right? It's for us to get what we want, which is a clean park. And that's what I want you to think about is think about either at the national level or the local level, what does that look like? You know, and it, a lot of times it just boils down to, hey, if people listen to us, we could get X, we could get Y, exactly like Michael said, right? Because the point is people listening. Yeah, and I want to make one other note there to just to kind of wrap this up in terms of selling things. I think we always want to be really careful that we're not over promising and then under delivering. That's a problem. But I also think that the other thing we should consider is, you know, if you walked into a job interview and you were and somebody said, why should we hire you for this position? You probably wouldn't say, I'm a pretty good candidate. I meet seven out of 10 of the criteria on your list. And I'm a pretty hard worker, except on days where it's warm and I'd prefer to be in the mountains hiking with my friends. Like that's the honest to God answer, right? For most of us, we're not perfect, but that doesn't sell things. That's not how Apple sells you a new phone. That's not how you sell yourself to an employer. So I would encourage you to think of it that way too, that we, we do have to create sometimes a picture that is not totally accurate, um, but is not us lying either. It's a fine line to walk. I think maybe we have time for one more. I saw Kanita had her hand raised. Yep, I was just about to say, um, Kanita's got her hand up. So um, I think this will be the last question here. So um, Kanita, you can go ahead. I'm still trying to get a sense of when approval voting is useful and when it's not. I mean, is it useful for when something is just a yes, no question, or if there's just one candidate versus another quest candidate, all of the approval voting things that I see are when there are three or more candidates and you're choosing a number of them that you approve of. But if you know, if it's just yes or no, well, you people probably don't approve of both yes and no. So is it, does it devolve to being the same as plurality voting if there are only two? Yeah, so I can go ahead and answer that real quick. Um, you're exactly right, Kanita. If there are only two candidates in a race, or if you're asking a yes or no question, like, you know, on a school, a school levy, for example, um, are we going to let to pass the levy or not? In those cases, yeah, you don't you don't need approval voting. Approval voting is for cases where you have more than two candidates or more than two options. That way you're not splitting the vote um, amongst, you know, various options that people might actually agree with. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to find the most, if I'm trying to get the concept of approval voting off to people, mm -hmm. or out to people trying to, you know, show the maximum number of cases where it would be useful. Sure. 
I think, um, and I, I can let Kirsten or Chris chime in here too, but I think a great, um, a great example here is primaries, because in primaries, there's always tons of candidates running, right? And then in the past couple um, presidential elections, we've seen even bigger lists of, of candidates running in the primaries than we saw before. Um, so I think that's a really relatable and easy example for you to use with people. Well, I think, uh, I think we have to run, but I, first I wanna say thank you to everyone who came. Uh, please send us your, your pitches. Your, your, uh, you can send it to our email, which we put in the chat. We'll send out afterwards. Um, and if you ever have any questions or if you want to try to give us your pitch, your best pitch, well, let's, let's have it. So yeah. thank, thank you very much. Yes, thanks, everyone. Have a great day.